Hello again and welcome to the RFM Audio Production Channel. On today's episode we are looking at how to mix the drum overheads and looking at the room channels as well. Listen as always, if you're enjoying this content, please don't forget to like, share and subscribe that way you don't miss a thing. All of these episodes are recorded live on Twitch. If you're interested in joining in in the live chat, then please follow the link down below and hit follow. Anyway, let's get on with today's video, shall we? So one of the first things we actually went over, uh, if you remember last time, guys, was uh, your phase relationships between your different instruments. Again, it'll be the close mic instruments. Uh, there's always going to be some sort of phase cancellation going on. So you're going to want to listen to each individual element uh, in relation to the overheads in order to make sure it's best in phase. You've got the best tone, best sound, uh, most frequency within it. So we're just going to go through that. We've already done this with the with the snare. We did the, the relation with the top and the, the bottom part. Uh, and we also went in relation with the the hi-hat and uh, sorry the the snare as a whole and the overhead one thing i would also recommend doing which actually helps with your phase relationship is with your overheads nudge them back either three or four milliseconds this will help again more with getting the the snare and the the kick in phase with the overheads and it just makes the whole thing sound a lot punchier and uh, it sounds just a lot more uh, close, closely knit together but we're going to go through some of the other instruments with phase just now so um, I never actually did phase inversion with the kick uh, but we can have a go at that as well along with the hi-hat and maybe some of the toms as well okay, so that's just the, the overheads we got going Thankfully, there's not actually that much variation in between the kick, but I think it sounds just a little bit punchier with the phase inverted. Let's hear that again. It's definitely a little bit tighter, actually. Definitely worth it. Fantastic. Right. Again, worth doing it with, I would say do it with every close mic you've got. Uh, the hi-hats, if I remember right, the hi-hat comes in here. I feel like the when I, the phase inverted with that actually sounds sounds a little bit washier so I'm gonna leave that without it. Uh, let's go to the rack tom. Right that's a that's quite a quick rack tom because there's not actually that many in here. You can hear with the face that's actually further away when the phase is enabled so no nah, that's fine as it is let's try this one i'm not so sure of that one nope fine without it there's another floor tom here Yeah, that sounds more distant. 
I've never actually really phase inverted any of these anyway. I thought I would just give it a go there. It's worth it is worth checking with everything. But for the most part I've never had to. Never found a reason or a need to. Probably won't need it for this either. But let's have a go. Yeah, that just sounds further away. So you'll find that your room mics are going to be far enough away from the kit that you won't need to phase invert them. There won't be any cancellation. It is almost a separate sound in itself. So I did go over like phase correction, the the snare video and the snare tri in the snare um, stream, and uh, also correcting with the overheads and kind of nudging. So I thought I would just kind of skim over that again today because it is worth making sure you get that right at the source right at the beginning um you can spend so much time uh trying to mix it trying to get a particular sound and just banging your head up against the wall uh without with having just hit that one button that button once and then you've got it the way you want it i'm not saying that's going to be like a fix all problems but it's definitely going to help you get punchier sounds, maybe a wee bit of a snappier snare and stuff like that. So it's always worth checking phase relationships first. Right. <clears throat> so let's get to the fun stuff. Let's actually get to the bit that we're all here for. It's probably EQing. Uh, actually, the actual mixing side of it. Uh, EQ these drums. Let's just listen to the drums as a whole. Do I have a drum bus? Yeah, I do not. It's okay. Right. Where's that coming from? Ah, that's where that horrible sounds come from. The destruction our room mate can cause. I don't know why that was all the way up there, but hey, we got it now. Right. I thought there was a weird sound coming out, but let's try that now. Right, there we go. So that was actually a good demonstration as to how a, a, a room mic can really add a detriment to it. Uh, I'm, I'm actually going to cover the room mics a little bit later on, uh, so I'll not go over to that, but we'll just get on with the, the EQ side of things. So, I already had an EQ set up here, and that was when we were cleaning out your, your low end, and I'm just going to go through that quickly. It's not such a bad thing uh, taking out some low end. See if you... There are two ways of thinking... that There are two ways that an engineer might think about actually mixing drums. And that might be either overheads first or close mics first. I generally work close mics first. 
Um, I usually like to work to get the kick on the get the kick sounding the way I want it, get the snare sounding the way I want it, and then I work on the overheads as a as a as a room mic almost. Uh, even though it is also working as the cymbals and and all the all the other instruments along with it. What you can do is if you're taking uh if you're taking like an overheads approach overheads first approach you can cut the the um what is it you can do like a, a relatively like a 12 db cut at like 80 hertz or something like that just to cut off some of the unnecessary lows somewhere between 60 and 80 hertz <coughs> <clears throat> or what you could do is if you're doing the other going the other way is you could actually if you're doing like the close mix first you could do a 6 db cut and then bring it as high up as maybe 200 maybe even 300 hertz um that way it's a nice natural slope is that my mids or is that my sides that's my sides there i like to cut off the the sides quite high at like 150 at a steep slope because uh, the sides don't need that much uh, low end anyway. But let's have it. Do you know what that's done? Is actually it's tightened the the kick. It's given a, a lovely, nice space towards the kick. Um, I felt like it f it feels a little bit more boxy when I've not got that cut. When I've got that cut like at 80, 80 instead of uh, further on. Let's see what it's like further in. Maybe let's go for 300 as far, push it as far as 300 hertz. Again, a soft cut. If you do like a, like a 12 dB cut, it's going to sound really unnatural and it's going to take it out of the room. So let's try this. Kind of helps with the toms a little bit as well. Quite like that. That's cooler. As I've always said, like when you're cleaning up the the low end, if you have an EQ that's capable of doing mid side cuts, I really recommend doing like a sharp. I usually like to do like a nice sharp uh, cut on the sides at roughly about 150 hertz. Um, your low end information is very much meant to be the center channel. It's meant to be that kind of mono feeling. That's why. Uh, you always get your kick and your your bass guitar right down the center. With uh, obviously with um, with overheads, it's a stereo field, so you end up going to get uh, a lot of low end in the side channels that you really just don't need. So it's worth just cutting out. Makes everything sound tighter, cleaner. Every all the low end instruments are in the center. It's going to sound punchier. It's going to do so much for your mix. So. Don't end, underestimate the the power of prep work uh, and just getting everything right before you get to all the fun stuff, such as the EQing and the compression. I mean, yeah, okay, that's part of EQing, but you could consider this clean up as well. You know, the creative EQing, the compression and stuff like that. I really like the sound of these drums. These are good. Now, before I go any further, do remember that when you're EQing overheads, when you're EQing, when you're compressing, compressing, when you're distorting overheads, a lot of people listen to the, the overheads as mainly a, a cymbal or a room mic. It, yes, it is there to capture the cymbals, which none of the close mics do. But it is. It's also 
it is also a room mic as well. So every move you make and every breath you take is actually <laughs> is actually going to affect what happens on the rest of the kit. It's going to affect what happens in the toms. It's going to affect what happens in the snare. What happens on the kick. All that stuff. So always consider these things when you're doing it. I have actually had a couple of I've had a couple of sessions where I have been I've received the drums and none of them well they're close mic'd but they've all been recorded onto a stereo channel just the drums themselves and I've had to like process and I might actually do a stream in that like you doing stuff in drums doing like uh, you could think of it as <coughs> It was sort of like stem mastering, but the, the the drums needed quite a bit of work on them. So technically, I would have preferred to have all of the individual stems, but the the artist didn't have that. So might actually go with that at some time in the future. So one thing you can do is I probably don't need that as far back as three hundred. Yeah, two hundred was good. So what we're gonna look at is maybe like the boxiness so if you're having a lot of you can get a lot of really unpleasant frequencies in a room <clears throat> it really depends on the on the overheads it really depends on the sound of the room itself uh let's do you know what this this room is actually quite a nice sounding room but let's see if there's any unpleasant frequencies if we push anything it's always gonna sound unpleasant but let's try it anyway if you're finding things a little bit boxy, then you can look roughly at about like 150 to 250 hertz in the overheads. So, let's have a try that. Look, that's 150. Let's try. <clears throat> we did a lot of clean up on the on the rest of the drums already, so that's not too bad, but it's worth I'm thinking it needs a little bit of You can actually hear that a lot in the snare. It actually adds a bit of snap to it, which is nice. If you start kind of going about there, you'll take a lot of the, roughly where the the like toms reside. It can actually just sound really scooped and unnatural. Might be what you're going for. If you're going for some extremes, like working in metal, you might want to have an interestingly scooped sound, but not in this kind of work. Then you've got the symbols themselves. Uh, they reside somewhere roughly between 5 and 8k uh, and above. So sometimes I like to add a little bit of a shelf. If I've got particularly dull uh, sounding... If I've got particularly dull sounding... Um, what do you call it? Dull sounding... Uh, symbols, that's the word. If you've got any particularly dull sounding symbols, uh, you can push them... It doesn't even have to be that dramatic. Um, I actually think these sound quite good, but let's see what it sounds like.
can actually hear that's also affecting the hi hat as well. even like push it at 10k now i'd actually just realized this that it actually already set it up for me but that's not such a bad thing <clears throat> if you want a larger sense of space then considering your space when you're eqing is a big and a great idea uh like i said um you'll probably want to carve out the 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 lows on your side channels Inversely, what you can do is you can actually boost the highs in your side channels, and that gives another sense of depth and space. Um, so this button we've got right here, this shows uh, it's working on both channels, right? It's bo working both mid and side. Listen to the difference in space when I swap between the two. So we're going to start off with the uh, on all channels, like boosting on all channels. See, having those boosted in the sides actually does widen it ever so slightly. No, okay, it's not a great deal amount. I, I'll admit, it's not a great deal amount. But it does open it just a slight bit, and that can actually be really useful. Um, let's listen to it in context of the mix, right? I mean, it still sounds bright in the center of it. You separate your highs to the sides and then your mids to the... Or your, your, your lows to the mid channel. Get some That's not bad. Quite like it. See, you don't have to go crazy on the overheads with EQing. You don't have to do an awful lot. Um, but what you can think about doing is if you want to raise a particular instrument, you try find where that instrument resides in the overheads as well. It can help boost that a little bit. Generally, I it's really quite simple what I do here, what I've already got going on here. Because if you do too much, it can end up really making it sound unnatural or scooped. Uh, you you do want to be careful and try not push those uh, those hi hats too high because you can end up. I mean, I've got that plus four. That's that's a relative. That's quite a that's quite a sizable. Um, that's quite a sizable boost. Uh, for the most part, or what people think conventionally is a sizable boost, but if you go too far, and it is one thing I noticed, like, you'll hear it in students' mixes, uh, and people who have just started mixing, who are studying audio, uh, maybe sound engineering, uh, even in my own mixes, you get two big frequencies that come up. You'll usually find it is very muddy, because they haven't quite learned proper how to properly, like, carve out the those muddy frequencies just yet or you'll get things sounding really harsh and high and especially those um symbols 
I have heard of some. I have tried it as well. Uh, sometimes, like you get a set of overheads that might have like been recorded with like ribbon mics, which tend to have like a nice rounding off of the high end, make them sound a little bit duller. And then you then add that artificially in EQ, and it actually does give an interesting uh, shimmer effect without it sounding too high or resonant or really unpleasant. It's worth giving that a go if you have that kind of technology. Ribbon mics are horribly expensive. Um, pretty sure for one ribbon mic it'll cost you somewhere between two to three grand. Um, you can get plenty of. And honestly, they're really easy to break as well. Uh, unless you're running a big professional recording studio, I think your money could be spent better elsewhere, to be honest. <clears throat> <clears throat> so, next, I think we'll actually have a listen to... We'll have a go at actually compressing the overheads. Compression is something I would recommend doing it very lightly. There's no need for aggressive compression unless you sort of want to go for that. Uh, uh, the way I always think of like heavy compression and overheads is uh, if you listen to uh, The Who, um, especially in the song My Generation, you can hear that they're... Granted, I don't know if that's natural compression or if they're really just battering themselves through the through the preamps, but you can hear like this... It, the, overheads and the especially the symbols get really squashed i don't feel like that's necessary it's compression is going to bring up a little bit of room sound on the overheads uh so you always have to remember that so that's why i like to do a little light compression it brings up that room sound it brings up a bit of energy in it but it won't um it won't wash out everything so let's pull up a compressor and <coughs> I like going for like aggressive compressors such as the CLA seventy six for likes of snares and and kicks because they do add a really sense of punchiness. This I do not feel is appropriate, so I'm going to go for the tried and true Pro C two. Probably just a light compression, even like a soft knee as well. So let's have a go. At it. I'm going for roughly like one to two B of gain, two dB of gain reduction. It doesn't have to be such a fast attack. It like I have pulled it back a little bit. Um, doesn't have to be so aggressive. I'm really just trying to pull down the 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 higher hits, maybe like the snare or the 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 cymbals, just down ever so slightly. Uh, to actually. Just to bring them back within the kit a wee bit and make sure it all fits together. I like to also put stuff in the drum bus and put a little bit of compression there. That way all of the drums actually feel like they're all together instead of like one of them poking out at all. 
Um, let's have a listen to what it would be sound like if I did some like aggressive uh, compression in these overheads. So basically it's bringing up a lot of the room sound. These are actually quite cleanly recorded overheads. see what we've actually got with the overhead so far what we've been doing is relatively minimal um but it can actually create a big impact so let's turn off the processing we've got so far first of all the the hi-hats uh, the, the symbols are really dull i think the snare and the kick disappear a little bit more as well See, without, without the effects processing on the overhead, even as minimal as it is, it's amazing how much it brings down the quality without that processing. This, to me, sounds like a professional set of drums. I mean, I do, I do try to do my best after all. Um, but, I mean, I've not been mixing as long as some of the, the big wigs out there are some of the guys that have been doing it for 10 or 20 odd years uh who are right at the top of their game and uh spouting out mixes for some of the, the greatest bands um or artists out there so just something as simple as cleaning up a wee bit of overheads can dramatically change what you've got going on i feel like there's quite a lack of definition in these drums without it and then Feels like you can hear everything clearly. The kick sit nicely under without it disappearing. Still got that clickiness. It's not disappearing. Snare, nice and snappy. Right, so what I actually did earlier, if you actually watched me sneaking about there, was I took out the room mics. Now, that is one thing I would suggest to anybody who's uh, engineering for another band out there. Don't be afraid to cut things out. There are just times where sometimes the, the arrangement doesn't call for it. The, the artist may have recorded it themselves and felt like it was necessary, I actually, I actually once uh, took out the, um, I actually took out these vocal parts, these backing vocals, which were supposed to be harmonizing with the main melody, and I took them out. I wouldn't recommend doing this with your artist. I actually took it out without asking if it was okay if I could do so. Um, I wanted to see if they would notice. But the reason I took that out was because that section felt too busy with the with the backing vocals uh, singing that wee melody. And it wasn't like there was any lyrics involved. It, it was just, they were just singing the mel this particular melody. 
and when I took it out, I felt like the whole thing gave it its resting point where it needed, but it opened it up quite nicely. And the the band were actually so happy with this, and they never actually mentioned it. Uh, I don't know if they, they felt like they needed to or not, um, but they were ecstatic with the mix and how it sounded. So don't be afraid to cut things out. I feel like these room mics are actually unnecessary, but we're going to try fit them in anyway. When you put them in, they don't need to be high. Um, if you push them too much, you're going to sound something like a, a trashy garage band kind of a garage band kind of situation. So let's bring them in ever so slightly. Well, You can actually hear the slap back from the snare in that. I really don't like it. Let's try pull it back. Because of that slap back, it actually takes out quite a bit of definition in the snare. Let's try to take out some of that boxiness, how about? See if that makes a difference. At low levels, I actually think it does add a little bit of excitement to the thing. So what we've got is we've got one room mic here, and then this side room, which I suspect is basically somebody left the, the door open, in the drum room and then had another microphone outside in the hallway uh, that can be a cool technique I've seen that a few times uh, but again let's have a go at this well, let's see what it sounds like in its own that's a lot cleaner and a lot less trashy Is it just me, but when I bring in these rooms, they actually sound like they're getting like the snare is getting duller. If you listen to the snare as I bring us up. Well, it's got a lot more snap and a lot more high end when you keep it down. But it does add a little bit of extra flavour and uh, excitement to it, so I'll probably keep it in at a low volume, roughly about here. Unless I was going for a like a series, like the thing about a room mic is good if you what you can do, which is an interesting another interesting mixing technique. Is you can slam the compress. Say there's a there's a section in it, maybe like right at the beginning, 
or maybe like in uh, in the bridge section uh, and you want to have like a really different sound what you can do is you can slam a compressor onto the room uh, of the uh, on the drum room and then just cut out all the other mics and all you have is this like trashy lo-fi sounding drum kit in the background that can sound incredible in the right context um there was I used to go to, uh, for those of you who live in Scotland or even Glasgow, you might have heard of Chem19. Um, a friend of mine there, he used to use what he would call the old war mic. And it was it was an old microphone they got, which was the same model that Winston Churchill used to do speeches on, right? So this is an old microphone. And they would, what he would do is he would use that as his room mic uh in what is it in the recording studio now you'd think it being an old microphone you'd think it would sound you know that kind of like old radio sound winston churchill speech but because it's like brand new cables it's like up-to-date cables up-to-date preamps up-to-date channels that is all going through and then up-to-date speakers it just sounds really trashy it doesn't sound like an old war mic it just sounds like a not a bad mic, just really trashy. Like, I keep using that, but it's simply what it sounded like. And it has its own character and personality to it. And he used to do that same thing, maybe like at times there'd be like a, a middle eight, so like a wee bridge section, where all he would have is have the, the old war mic playing, even if it was just in Flamin Mono. I mean, the war mic was just a mono microphone. It's not like we had two of them. Um, <clears throat> And it would sound absolutely incredible. It would have a nice trashy sound. But you can do that with room mics as well. Right, what we could do is we could have that just at the, the middle eights bit. And then it brings in the whole... So what if I did it like So let's have all that muted. Right. So at this it was sort of like like this particular session. Not as fast as that. And then bring in the whole thing. So, uh, right. So then it went. try something like that it's probably not the best example i would work on more with that but it's actually not such a bad idea to go for uh last thing i think i will cover uh now that i've actually done the 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 rooms see i don't think it needs to be now i'm listening to all yeah. i think those overheads are fine That's actually a pretty good sound set of drums we've got there. The last thing I would go cover is likes of reverbs and delays. Do you really need it in overheads? 
I'd I'd say no. Um, not in these ones anyway. You've got to understand what kind of what kind of drums sound your your client or your mix is needing. If somebody sent you a set of drums that sounds like really dry and really close to each other, maybe that's the intention of the maybe that's the intention of the the recording engineer. If you feel like it's it might be a home recording, maybe they felt like that was the best thing that they had to do was to get it as dry as possible, so for then you to manipulate the the room sound, at the end of it, um, that could be the reason as well. Uh, that could that could just be uh maybe uh down to an experience of the recording engineer, um, in that case you should make it clear with the band. If you feel like the the track needs uh, an overlay, like maybe quite a roomy sound or maybe a larger sound, then you can talk with them about it and then maybe you could create it yourself. <clears throat> but when it comes to overheads, I tend to do none at all or maybe if I feel like it needs it, a minimal amount, a very, very small amount. Don't put it on room mics. For the most part, they'll just sound even more trashy than usual. Um, so I would keep low with that one. 